Benedict XVI is Joseph Ratzinger. Joseph Ratzinger was one of the most radical theologians at Vatican II, where his ideas were influential in guiding the revolutionary course of the Council. At Vatican II, Ratzinger hung around with notorious heretics such as Karl Rahner, and even though he was a priest, Joseph Ratzinger showed up at Vatican II not in clerical garb, but in a suit and tie. Ratzinger was named, quote, Cardinal by Paul VI in 1977 and became prefect for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith five years later. During these years, Ratzinger wrote a staggering number of books. The heresies from Ratzinger that are covered in this tape come from having read many of his speeches and 24 books written by him. Many Catholics are familiar with the fact that in the year 2000, the Vatican allegedly revealed the third secret of Fatima. Most traditionalists immediately recognized that the so-called third secret which the Vatican released was not the real third secret of Fatima, but rather that a massive fraud had been perpetrated on the world. The primary author of the document which attempted to convince the world of this fraud against Our Lady's message of Fatima was Joseph Ratzinger Benedict XVI. The document on the so-called third secret authored by Ratzinger and another was an attempt to debunk the message of Fatima, as the Los Angeles Times was forced to admit. In the document, Ratzinger referred to only one Fatima scholar. He referred to Father Edward Donny, who held that large portions of the message of Fatima were fabrications of Lucy. By referring to Donny, Ratzinger showed that he also holds that the message of Fatima is a fabrication. This reveals one of the primary characteristics of Ratzinger. He is a deceiver. He will give the appearance of devotion to something while trying to rip apart its meaning. He will give the appearance of conservatism while inculcating the most abominable heresies. We will now cover the amazing heresies of Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict the Sixteenth. Benedict the Sixteenth's heresy on the Jews. Based on scripture and tradition, the Catholic Church teaches infallibly that it is necessary for salvation to believe in Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith. John chapter 8, quote, For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sin. Pope Eugene IV, Council of Florence, 1439, ex cathedra, quote, Whoever wishes to be saved needs above all to hold the Catholic faith. It is necessary for eternal salvation that he faithfully believe also in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God is God and man. The Catholic Church also teaches infallibly that the Old Covenant ceased with the coming of Christ and was replaced with the New Covenant. The Council of Florence taught that those who practice the Old Law in the Jewish religion are sinning mortally and are, quote, alien to the Christian faith and not in the least fit to participate in eternal salvation, unless someday they recover from these errors. In 2001, however, the Pontifical Biblical Commission released a book entitled, quote, The Jewish People and Their Sacred Scriptures in the Christian Bible. This book rejects the dogma that the Old Covenant has ceased. It teaches that the Old Covenant is still valid, and that the Jews wait for the coming of the Messiah, which was part of the Old Covenant, is also still valid. It teaches that Jesus does not have to be seen as the prophesied Messiah. It is possible to see him as the Jews do, as not the Messiah and not the Son of God. In section 2a5, the book states, quote, Jewish messianic expectation is not in vain. In section 2a7, it states, quote, To read the Bible as Judaism does necessarily involves an implicit acceptance of all its presuppositions, which exclude faith in Jesus as Messiah and Son of God. Christians can and ought to admit that the Jewish reading of the Bible is a possible one. So according to this Vatican book, Christians can and ought to admit that the Jewish position that Jesus is not the Son of God and the prophesied Messiah is a possible one. This is Antichrist. 1 John 2 verse 22, quote, He who denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist. The preface for this totally heretical book was written by none other than Joseph Ratzinger, the now Benedict XVI. Heresy is a rejection of a dogma of the Catholic faith, 
While apostasy is a rejection of the entire Christian faith, this book contains both heresy and apostasy, fully endorsed by Benedict XVI. And Benedict XVI teaches the same denial of Jesus Christ in a number of his books. Benedict XVI, God of the World, 2000, page 209, quote, It is of course possible to read the Old Testament so that it is not directed toward Christ. It does not point unequivocally to Christ. And if Jews cannot see the promises as being fulfilled in him, this is not just ill will on their part, but genuinely because of the obscurity of the text. There are perfectly good reasons then for denying that the Old Testament refers to Christ, and for saying, no, that is not what he said. And there are also good reasons for referring it to him. That is what the dispute between Jews and Christians is about. Benedict XVI says that there are perfectly good reasons for not believing that the Old Testament refers to Christ as the prophesied Messiah. He says that the Old Testament doesn't point unequivocally to our Lord as the Messiah. Benedict XVI just denied the entire Christian faith again. What makes this apostasy all the more outrageous is the fact that the New Testament is filled with passages which declare that our Lord is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. To quote just one passage of many, our Lord specifically tells the Jews that what is written in the Old Testament concerning him will convict them. John chapter 5 verses 39, 45 through 47, quote, Search the scriptures, for you think in them to have life everlasting, and the same are they that give testimony of me. There is one that accuseth you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you did believe Moses, you would perhaps believe me also, for he wrote of me. But according to the apostate Benedict XVI, all these biblical declarations, including our Lord's own words, may be false. According to him, the Jewish reading that our Lord is not the Messiah, not the Son of God, and not foretold in the Old Testament, is possible and valid. Nothing could be more heretical apostate or antichrist. Benedict XVI also denies Jesus Christ in his book Milestones. Benedict XVI, Milestones, 1998, pages 53 and 54, quote, I have evermore come to the realization that Judaism and the Christian faith described in the New Testament are two ways of appropriating Israel's scriptures, two ways that in the end are both determined by the position one assumes with regard to the figure of Jesus of Nazareth. The scripture we today call Old Testament is in itself open to both ways. Benedict XVI again declares that scripture is open to holding the Jewish view of Jesus that Jesus is not the Son of God. And this is why Benedict XVI repeatedly teaches the heresy that Jews don't need to believe in Christ for salvation. Benedict XVI, God in the World, 2000, pages 150 and 151, quote, There the Jews know to Christ brings the Israelis into conflict with the subsequent acts of God. But at the same time we know that they are assured of the faithfulness of God. They are not excluded from salvation. This is a total rejection of Catholic dogma. And this is why on August 19, 2005, a Friday at noon, the same day and hour that Jesus was crucified, Benedict XVI arrived at the Jewish synagogue in Cologne, Germany, and took active part in a Jewish worship service. To take active part in non-Catholic worship is a sin against the divine law and the first commandment, as was always taught before Vatican II. In taking part in a Jewish worship service, Benedict XVI committed a public act of apostasy. At the synagogue, Benedict XVI was seated prominently near the front. The synagogue was packed with Jews who were in there to see him. Benedict XVI was not only an integral part of the Jewish worship service, he was its main feature. This is, without any doubt, active participation in the Jewish religion. Very close to Benedict XVI, the cantor of the synagogue prayed and sang Jewish prayers at the top of his lungs. Benedict made gestures such as bowing his head and clapping his hands to show his approval and participation in the Jewish service. He joined the Jews in the Kaddish prayer, and Yiddish music blared in the background. When Benedict XVI rose to speak and eventually to pray in the synagogue, the entire synagogue rose to its feet and applauded him applauded him for his acceptance of their religion. Everyone on earth who saw this event knows that it had one meaning. 
Benedict XVI has no problem with Jews who reject Jesus Christ, and they have no obligation to accept Jesus Christ to be saved. Benedict XVI teaches that Jews can be saved, that the Old Covenant is valid, and that Jesus Christ is not necessarily the Messiah. He is a bold heretic against the Gospel and the Catholic faith. Pope Eugene IV, Council of Florence, Cantate Damo, 1441, ex cathedra, quote, The Holy Roman Church firmly believes, professes, and preaches that all those who are outside the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but also Jews, or heretics and schismatics, cannot share an eternal life, and will go into the everlasting fire which was prepared for the devil and his angels, unless they are joined to the Church before the end of their lives. Benedict XVI addressed the Chief Rabbi of Rome January 16, 2006, quote, Distinguished Chief Rabbi, you were recently entrusted with the spiritual guidance of Rome's Jewish community. I offer you my heartfelt good wishes for your mission, and I assure you of my own and my collaborators' cordial esteem and friendship. This is apostasy. Benedict XVI encourages the Chief Rabbi in his, quote, mission. He also expresses his esteem for the rabbi and his Christ-rejecting apostolate. Benedict XVI addressed the Jewish community September 12, 2008, quote, I cannot neglect on an occasion such as this to recall the eminent role played by the Jews of France in the building up of the whole nation and of their prestigious contribution to her spiritual patrimony. Benedict XVI's Heresies with Islam Islam is a false religion which rejects the Trinity and the divinity of our Lord. The Catholic Church officially teaches that Islam is an abomination, a false religion from which people need to be converted and saved. Pope Eugene IV, Council of Basel, 1434, quote, The abominable sect of Muhammad. But Benedict XVI says that there is a noble Islam. Benedict XVI saw the earth, 1996, page 244, quote, There is a noble Islam. He is saying that a false religion is good. This is apostasy. Bank the 16th says that Islam represents greatness. Bank the 16th, Truth and Tolerance, 2004, page 204, quote, Yet even Islam, with all the greatness it represents, is always in danger of losing balance. He says that Islam, a false religion which rejects the divinity of Jesus Christ and the entire Catholic faith, represents greatness. This is apostasy. Islam represents infidelity the rejection of the Trinity, and darkness. Benedict XVI addressed to representatives of Islam August 20, 2005, quote, The believer and all of us as Christians and Muslims are believers. You guide Muslim believers and train them in the Islamic faith. You therefore have a great responsibility for the formation of the younger generation. Benedict XVI Catechesis August 24, 2005, quote, as well as esteem for the other great religious traditions. Islam occupies a special place among them. Its followers worship the same God. Notice that Benedict XVI doesn't merely esteem the members of false religions, but the false religions themselves. This is apostasy. On November 30, 2006, Benedict XVI visited the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, Turkey. Benedict XVI prayed toward Mecca with the Grand Mufti. Benedict XVI also crossed his arms in the Muslim prayer gesture called the Gesture of Tranquility. Benedict XVI addressed January 19, 2007, quote, I frequently express the respect of the Catholic Church for Islam and the esteem of the Pope and the faithful for Muslim believers, especially during my visit to Istanbul's Blue Mosque. Benedict XVI addressed December 16, 2007, quote, My visit to Turkey afforded me the opportunity to show also publicly my respect for the Islamic religion. Benedict XVI addressed November 28, 2006, quote, I greet all the Muslims in Turkey with particular esteem. This noble land has also seen a remarkable flowering of Islamic civilization in the most diverse fields. Benedict XVI Catechesis, December 6, 2006, quote, I thus had a favorable opportunity to renew my sentiments of esteem for the Muslims and for the Islamic civilizations. Benedict XVI addressed September 25, 2006, quote, 
I should like to reiterate today all the esteem and the profound respect that I have for Muslim believers. Benedict the 16th, May 9, 2009, addressed to Muslim leaders outside a mosque, quote, Places of worship like this splendid mosque, named after the revered late king, stand out like jewels across the earth's surface. From the ancient to the modern, the magnificent to the humble, they all point to the divine. Places of worship like the splendid Al Hussein bin Talal Mosque, named after the revered late king, stand out like jewels across the earth's surface. From the ancient to the modern, the magnificent to the humble, they all point to divine. Benedict the Sixteenth Address, September twelfth, two thousand and eight. Quote. Je remercie les délégués de la communauté musulmane française d'avoir accepté de participer à cette rencontre. Je leur adresse mes voeux les meilleurs en ce temps du Ramadan. Benedict the Sixteenth, May sixteenth, two thousand and eight, addressed to bishops from Thailand. Quote. You have readily expressed to me your great respect for the Buddhist monasteries and the esteem you have for the contribution they make to the social and cultural life of the Thai people. Benedict the 16th address May 24th 2007 quote, esteem and respect for all other religions. So Benedict the 16th esteems all these non-Catholic religions that totally reject Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith. Benedict the 16th is a total apostate. Benedict the 16th tells us that pagan and idolatrous religions are high and pure. Benedict the 16th saw the earth 1996 page 23, quote, "In the Indian religious cosmos, Hinduism is a rather misleading designation for a multiplicity of religions. There are very different forms, very high and pure ones." He says that idolatrous religions are high and pure. This is heresy and apostasy. 1 Corinthians 10.20, quote, The things which the heathen sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. Bank the 16th denying outside the church there is no salvation. What we have seen thus far proves many times over that Benedict the 16th rejects the defined dogma. Outside the Catholic Church there is no salvation. Benedict the 16th holds that we shouldn't even convert heretics and schismatics. But here are some more examples of heresy where he is specifically addressing and denying this crucial dogma. Bank the 16th, Saw the Earth, 1996, page 24, quote, question. But could we not also accept that someone can be saved through a faith other than the Catholic? Answer. This undoubtedly happens on a large scale. The church teaches that there is no salvation outside the church. Bank the 16th teaches that there is undoubtedly salvation outside the church on a large scale. This is a bold rejection of the dogma outside the church there is no salvation. Pope Gregory the 16th, August 15th, 1832, quote, They should consider the testimony of Christ himself, that those who are not with Christ are against him, and that they disperse unhappily who do not gather with him. Therefore, without a doubt, they will perish forever unless they hold the Catholic faith whole and inviolate. Bank the 16th says that there are pagan saints. Bank the 16th, Truth and Tolerance, 2004, page 207, quote, In every age there have been and still are pagan saints. This is bold heresy. Remember, Pope Eugene IV infallibly defined that all who die as pagans are not saved. Pope Eugene IV, Council of Florence, ex cathedra, quote, all those who are outside the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but also Jews or heretics and schismatics, cannot share in eternal life. Benedict the Sixteenth teaches that there are many ways that lead to heaven besides the Christian faith. Benedict the Sixteenth, Co-Workers of the Truth, 1990, page 217, quote, The question that really concerns us, the question that really oppresses us, is why it is necessary for us in particular to practice the Christian faith in its totality. Why, when there are so many other ways that lead to heaven and salvation, it should be required of us to bear day after day the whole burden of ecclesial dogmas and of the ecclesial ethos. When we raise the question about the foundation and meaning of our Christian existence, there slips in a certain false hankering for the apparently more comfortable life of other people who are also going to heaven. 
But what a strange attitude it is to find the duties of our Christian life unrewarding, just because the denarius of salvation can be gained without them. Bank the Sixteenth asked that all-important question, Why is it necessary to practice the Christian faith if there are other ways to salvation? Benedict the Sixteenth answers the question by admitting that there are many other ways besides the Christian faith that lead to salvation. He even criticizes people for asking such a question. Benedict the Sixteenth has bluntly rejected a revealed truth of the Catholic faith. Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation, and that the Catholic faith is necessary for salvation. Pope Leo the Twelfth, May fifth, eighteen twenty four, quote. By divine faith we hold one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and that no other name under heaven is given to men except the name of Jesus Christ in which we must be saved. This is why we profess that there is no salvation outside the church. Bank the Sixteenth teaches that all religions can lead to God. Bank the Sixteenth, Saw the Earth, 1996, page 29, quote, In all religions there are men of interior purity, who through their myths somehow touch the great mystery and find the right way of being human. This is totally heretical. Benedict XVI's teaching that Protestants and schismatics don't need to be converted. Heretics and schismatics such as Protestants and the Eastern Orthodox are outside the Catholic Church and must be converted to the Catholic faith for unity and salvation. It is necessary for them to accept all the Catholic dogmas and councils including the dogmatic definitions at Vatican I in 1870. This is infallible Catholic teaching. However, Benedict XVI teaches that Protestants and Eastern schismatics don't need to be converted and don't need to accept Vatican Council I. Benedict XVI, Principles of Catholic Theology, 1982, pages 197 and 198. Quote, On the part of the West, the maximum demand would be that the East recognize the primacy of the Bishop of Rome and the full scope of the definition of 1870, and in so doing submit in practice to a primacy such as been accepted by the Uniate Churches. As regards Protestantism, the maximum demand of the Catholic Church would be that the Protestant ecclesiological ministers be regarded as totally invalid, and that Protestants be converted to Catholicism. None of the maximum solutions offers any real hope of unity. Notice that Benedict XVI specifically mentions, and then bluntly rejects the traditional teaching of the Catholic Church, that the Protestants and Eastern schismatics must be converted to the Catholic faith. He says that their conversion and acceptance of Vatican I and the papacy is not the way for unity. This is a total rejection of the Catholic faith. He repeats the same heresy on the next page of his book, where he says that non-Catholics are not required to accept the papal primacy. Bank the Sixteenth Principles of Catholic Theology, 1982, page 198, quote, Nor is it possible, on the other hand, for him to regard as the only possible form, and consequently as binding on all Christians, the form this primacy has taken in the 19th and 20th centuries. The symbolic gestures of Paul VI, and in particular his kneeling before the representative of the ecumenical patriarch, the schismatic patriarch Athenagoras, were an attempt to express precisely this. Benedict XVI is referring to the papal primacy here, and he says that all Christians are not bound to believe in the papal primacy as defined by Vatican I in 1870. This means that Benedict XVI claims to be a Catholic and the Pope, while he holds that heretics and schismatics are not bound to believe in the papacy. This is one of the greatest frauds in human history. Benedict XVI even admits that Paul VI's ecumenical gestures with the schismatics were meant to show precisely that the schismatics don't have to accept the papal primacy. This is a blatant denial of Vatican Council I. Pope Pius IX, Vatican Council I, ex cathedra, quote, All the faithful of Christ must believe that the apostolic see and the Roman pontiff hold primacy over the whole world. This is the doctrine of Catholic truth, from which no one can deviate and keep his faith in salvation. The Church itself was founded by our Lord upon the papal primacy, as the Gospel declares. Pope Boniface VIII, Unum Sanctum, November 18, 1302, ex cathedra, quote, We declare, say, define, and proclaim to every human creature that they, by absolute necessity for salvation, are entirely subject to the Roman pontiff. 
People need to seriously meditate on how bad this is, how heretical and schismatic it is, that Benedict XVI holds that all Christians are not required to accept the primacy of the popes. It alone proves that he is a manifest heretic. The same astounding heresy has been taught by Benedict XVI's prefect for promoting Christian unity, Cardinal Walter Casper. Cardinal Walter Casper, quote, Today we no longer understand ecumenism in the sense of a return, by which the others would be converted and return to being Catholics. This was expressly abandoned by Vatican II. Casper's statement is so heretical that even many of the defenders of Benedict XVI have labeled Casper a heretic. But as we've seen, Benedict XVI believes the exact same thing. In the following quote, we see that Benedict XVI uses basically the exact same words as Casper in rejecting Catholic dogma. Benedict XVI addressed to Protestants at World Youth Day, August 19, 2005, quote, And now we ask, what does it mean to restore the unity of all Christians? This unity does not mean what could be called ecumenism of the return. That is, to deny and to reject one's own faith history. Absolutely not. Just like the notorious heretic Casper, Benedict XVI blatantly rejects the ecumenism of the return. That is, that non-Catholics return to the Catholic faith and reject their heretical sects. He rejects the teaching of Pope Pius XI word for word. Pope Pius XI, Mortalium Animus, number 10, January 6, 1928, quote, The union of Christians can only be promoted by promoting the return to the one true Church of Christ of those who are separated from it. Benedict XVI could not be more formally heretical. He holds that Protestants and Eastern schismatics don't need to be converted and accept Vatican I. He is a blatant rejecter of the necessity of the Catholic faith for salvation and the dogmatic teaching of Vatican I. That is why Benedict XVI even encouraged the schismatic patriarch to resume his ministry. Benedict XVI addressed November 12, 2005, quote, In this regard, I ask you, venerable brothers, to convey my cordial greeting to Patriarch Maxim, first hierarch of the Orthodox Church of Bulgaria. Please express to him my best wishes for his health and for the happy resumption of his ministry. Benedict XVI encourages the non-Catholic schismatic patriarch to resume his non-Catholic and schismatic ministry. Benedict XVI addressed May 23, 2005, quote, the Venerable Orthodox Church of Bulgaria. He calls a non-Catholic schismatic church venerable. Benedict XVI is a schismatic. Here are just a few examples of Benedict XVI praising these non-Catholic schismatic bishops and their non-Catholic churches. Benedict XVI message February 1, 2009, quote, To His Holiness Kirill, Patriarch of Moscow and of all Russia, I greet your holiness with joy as you undertake the great responsibility of shepherding the venerable Russian Orthodox Church. I wish, therefore, to reaffirm my esteem and my spiritual closeness. I pray that our Heavenly Father will grant you the abundant gifts of the Holy Spirit in your ministry and enable you to guide the Church. Conscious of the enormous responsibilities which accompany the spiritual and pastoral ministry to which the Holy Spirit has called you, I ask Almighty God to bless you with his love, to watch over the beloved Russian church. Benedict XVI, letter, May 29, 2008, quote, To His Holiness Alexis II, Patriarch of Moscow and all Russia, the visit to Russia of His Eminence Cardinal Walter Kasper offers me a welcome opportunity to extend my cordial greetings, to express my esteem for your ministry in the Russian Orthodox Church. Benedict the Sixteenth Message, September 12, 2007, quote, To His Beatitude, Daniel Archbishop of Bucharest, Patriarch of the Romanian Orthodox Church, the new pastor called to lead the Romanian Orthodox Church, I ask the Holy Spirit to sustain you in this weighty office. May He help the Romanian Orthodox Church in her development. Benedict the Sixteenth Telegram, January 28, 2008, to New, quote, Orthodox Metropolitan, quote, Christodoulos, Archbishop of Athens and all Greece, this distinguished pastor of the Church of Greece. Benedict XVI, Catechesis, January 21, 2009, quote, The new patriarch of their venerable and great Orthodox Church. Benedict XVI, Message, May 6, 2009, quote, 
I also impart a warm greeting and blessing to the beloved Orthodox Patriarch and to all the members of that noble church. Benedict Sixteenth message to quote Orthodox Schismatic Patriarch February 20, 2006, quote, To His Holiness Alexei II, Patriarch of Moscow, and of all the Russias, I invoke abundant blessings from the Lord upon you yourself and upon your ministry, generously dedicated to the great cause of the gospel. May you continue to fulfill fruitfully the mission that God has entrusted to you. Benedict XVI Common Declaration with Schismatic Patriarch Bartholomew I, November 30, 2006, quote, Our responsibility as pastors in the Church of Christ. So according to Benedict XVI, to be a schismatic is to be a pastor in the Church of Christ. So we can see just from these few examples that Benedict XVI praises the schismatic quote orthodox and their leaders. To be a schismatic is praiseworthy according to Benedict XVI. More heresies with the Protestants from Benedict XVI. Benedict XVI explicitly rejects converting Protestants again in his book Principles of Catholic Theology. Benedict XVI Principles of Catholic Theology, 1982, page 202, quote, It means that the Catholic Church does not insist on the dissolution of the Protestant confessions and the demolishing of their churches, but hopes, rather, that they will be strengthened in their confessions and in their ecclesial reality. Benedict XVI doesn't want the Protestant religions dissolved and converted to Catholicism, but hopes, rather, that they will be strengthened in their confession of Protestantism. At Vatican II, Benedict XVI also denied that non-Catholics should be converted. Benedict XVI, Theological Highlights of Vatican II, 1966, pages 61 and 68, quote, Meantime, the Catholic Church has no right to absorb other churches, a basic unity of churches that remain churches, yet become one church, must replace the idea of conversion. Benedict XVI is not even remotely Catholic. Benedict XVI praises the greatness of Luther's spiritual fervor. Martin Luther was one of the worst heretics in church history. Luther attacked the Catholic Church and its dogmas with ferocity. While never denouncing Luther as a heretic, Benedict XVI often speaks positively of Luther's views and even praises him. At Vatican II, Benedict XVI even complained that the document Gaudium et Spes relied too much on Teilhard de Chardin and not enough on Martin Luther. Benedict XVI, Principles of Catholic Theology, page 263, quote, That which in Luther makes all else bearable because of the greatness of his spiritual fervor. Benedict XVI is also credited with saving the 1999 Joint Declaration with the Lutherans on Justification. Benedict XVI encourages Methodists to enter into the totally heretical Joint Declaration with the Lutherans on Justification which rejects the Council of Trent. Benedict XVI addressed a Methodist December 9, 2005, quote, I have been encouraged by the initiative which would bring the member churches of the World Methodist Council into association with the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification signed by the Catholic Church and the Lutheran World Federation in 1999. The Joint Declaration with the Lutherans on Justification rejects the Council of Trent by teaching that its infallible canons no longer apply to the Lutherans. It also teaches that the worst Lutheran heresies, including justification by faith alone, are not condemned by Trent. Benedict XVI adheres to this Protestant agreement and asserts that it was signed by the Catholic Church. Benedict XVI praises the non-Catholic ecumenical monastery of Taizé and says that more should be formed. The Ecumenical Monastery of Taizé is located in France. It is a monastery made up of over a hundred brothers from various non-Catholic denominations, including Protestants. Benedict XVI Principles of Catholic Theology, 1982, page 304, quote, Taizé has been, without a doubt, the leading example of an ecumenical inspiration. Similar communities of faith and of shared living should be formed elsewhere. So more of these non-Catholic ecumenical monasteries should be formed according to Benedict XVI. Benedict XVI also gave communion to Brother Roger, the Protestant founder of the Taizé community. And when Brother Roger died in August 2005, Benedict XVI said that this Protestant heretic went immediately to heaven. 
Bannock the 16th, August 17, 2005, on Brother Roger, quote, Brother Roger, founder of a non-Catholic sect, is in the hands of eternal goodness, eternal love. He has arrived at eternal joy. So much for the fact that Brother Roger rejected the Catholic Church, rejected its dogmas for decades, and became the founder of his own non-Catholic sect. He still went to heaven according to Benedict XVI. This is manifest heresy. He even says that the heretic Brother Roger is guiding us from on high. Benedict XVI addressed to Protestants at World Youth Day, August 19, 2005, quote, Brother Roger, he is now visiting us and speaking to us from on high. If you believe that Benedict XVI is a Catholic Pope, you might as well attend the Protestant Church. Pope St. Gregory the Great, quote, The Holy Universal Church teaches that it is not possible to worship God truly, except in her, and asserts that all who are outside of her will not be saved. Benedict XVI teaches that the Protestant Eucharist is a saving Eucharist. Benedict XVI, Pilgrim Fellowship of Faith, 2002, page 248, quote, Even a theology along the lines of the concept of apostolic succession, as is in force in the Catholic and in the Orthodox Church, should in no way deny the saving presence of the Lord in the Evangelical Lord's Supper. Protestants don't have a valid Eucharist. They don't have valid bishops and priests, since they lack apostolic succession. But Benedict XVI says that even if one accepts the Catholic dogma of apostolic succession, one should in no way deny the saving presence of the Lord in the Evangelical Protestant Lord's Supper. According to Benedict XVI, the Protestants are not deprived of the saving Eucharistic presence. This means that you can get the saving Eucharistic presence at the local Protestant church. This is astounding heresy. John chapter 6, quote, Amen, amen, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. Benedict XVI teaches that Protestantism saves. Benedict XVI, Pilgrim Fellowship of Faith, 2002, page 251, quote, The burdensome question of apostolic succession does not detract from the spiritual dignity of evangelical Christianity or from the saving power of the Lord at work within it. This is a bold rejection of the dogma outside the church there is no salvation. If it were true, there would be absolutely no reason to be Catholic. Pope Gregory the Sixteenth, May 27, 1832, quote, Finally, some of these misguided people attempt to persuade themselves and others that men are not saved only in the Catholic religion, but that even heretics may attain eternal life. Benedict XVI says that Protestantism is not heresy. Benedict XVI, The Meaning of Christian Brotherhood, pages 87 and 88, quote, There is no appropriate category in Catholic thought for the phenomenon of Protestantism today. One could say the same of the relationship to the separated churches of the East. It is obvious that the old category of heresy is no longer of any value. Protestantism has made an important contribution to the realization of Christian faith, fulfilling a positive function. The conclusion is inescapable then. Protestantism today is something different from heresy in the traditional sense, a phenomenon whose true theological place has not yet been determined. Protestantism is the rejection of many dogmas of the Catholic faith. Protestantism is not only heresy, but the most notorious collection of heresies with which the Church has ever had to contend. Pope Pius XI, January 26, 1923, quote, The heresies begotten by the Protestant Reformation. It is in these heresies that we discover the beginnings of that apostasy of mankind from the Church. But Benedict XVI tells us that Protestants are not heretics, and that Protestantism itself is not heresy. This is undeniable proof that Benedict XVI is not a Catholic, but a complete heretic. Benedict XVI Address, October 27, 2006, quote, The Richness of Different Christian Traditions Benedict XVI Address, November 23, 2006, to Dr. Rowan Williams, primate of the Anglican Communion, quote, It is our fervent hope that the Anglican Communion will remain grounded in the Gospels and the Apostolic Tradition. May the Lord continue to bless you and your family, and may he strengthen you in your ministry to the Anglican Communion. 
The Anglican sect is grounded not in apostolic tradition, but in the tradition of Henry VIII's adultery and schismatic break from the Catholic Church. Benedict XVI encourages the schismatic and heretical head of the Anglican sect in his, quote, ministry, and mocks all the saints and martyrs who suffered and died as martyrs, because they wouldn't become Anglicans. Benedict XVI's heresy against the sacraments. In 2001, the Vatican approved a document with the Assyrian Schismatic Church of the East. The document says that members of the Vatican II Church can go to the Schismatic Church and receive communion and vice versa. The document was approved by Benedict XVI. The problem with this document, besides the fact that the Assyrian Schismatics are not Catholics, is that the Schismatic Liturgy has no words of consecration, no institution narrative. Benedict XVI mentioned the problem in his book Pilgrim Fellowship of Faith. Benedict XVI Pilgrim Fellowship of Faith, 2002, page 232, quote, This case needed special studies to be made, because the anaphora of Adai and Mari, most commonly in use by the Assyrians, does not include an institution narrative, but these difficulties were able to be overcome. Benedict XVI admits that the schismatic liturgy has no institution narrative, which is the words of consecration, but he still approved receiving communion at this schismatic liturgy, which has no words of consecration. Benedict XVI came to this incredible decision because he denies that words are necessary for a valid consecration. Benedict XVI, Principles of Catholic Theology, 1982, page 377, quote, the validity of the liturgy depends primarily not on specific words, but on the community of the Church. This is a total rejection of Catholic sacramental teaching. Pope Eugene IV, Council of Florence, 1439, quote, All these sacraments are made up of three elements, namely things as the matter, words as the form, and the person of the minister, who confers the sacrament with the intention of doing what the Church does. If any of these is lacking, the sacrament is not affected. The fact that Benedict XVI holds that masses without any words of consecration are valid proves that he doesn't even have a whiff of the Catholic faith. He is a manifest heretic against the Church's sacramental teaching, and this heresy is repeated in a number of his books. Benedict XVI says that infant baptism has no reason to exist. Bank the Sixteenth Principles of Catholic Theology, page 43, quote, The conflict over infant baptism shows the extent to which we have lost sight of the true nature of faith. Wherever it is severed from the catechumenate, baptism loses its raison d'etre, its reason to be. Bank the Sixteenth says that whenever baptism is separated from the catechumenate, for example in infant baptism, it loses its reason to be. Infant baptism has no meaning or purpose according to Benedict XVI. That is why in his book God in the World, Benedict XVI rejects the necessity of infant baptism as unenlightened. Benedict XVI, God in the World, 2000, page 401, quote, Question, what happens to the millions of children who are killed in their mother's wombs? Answer, the question about children who could not be baptized because they were aborted, then presses upon us that much more urgently. Earlier ages had devised a teaching that seems to me rather unenlightened. They said that baptism endows us by means of sanctifying grace, with the capacity to gaze upon God. This was one way in which people sought to justify the necessity of baptizing infants as early as possible. But the solution is itself questionable. He says that earlier ages had devised, not received from Christ, the teaching about the necessity of baptizing infants for them to attain sanctifying grace. He says that this teaching is unenlightened. This is gross heresy. It was infallibly defined by the councils of Florence and Trent that the sacrament of baptism is necessary for salvation and that infants who die without the sacrament of baptism cannot be saved. Benedict XVI's Heresies Against Sacred Scripture The Catholic Church teaches that sacred scripture is the infallible and inerrant word of God. But Benedict XVI says that sacred scripture's creation account is based on pagan creation accounts. Benedict XVI, A New Song for the Lord, 1995, page 86, quote, The pagan creation accounts on which the biblical story is in part based. If the biblical creation account in the book of Genesis is based in part on pagan creation accounts, 
This means that the biblical account is not original or inspired directly by God. Benedict XVI calls into doubt the stone tablets of the Exodus account. In Exodus 31, we read that God gave Moses two stone tablets written with the finger of God. Exodus 31:18 quote, And the Lord, when he had ended these words in Mount Sinai, gave to Moses two stone tables of testimony, written with the finger of God. Bank the 16th, God in the World, 2000, pages 165 through 168, quote, Question, were these laws really handed over to Moses by God when he appeared on Mount Sinai? as stone tablets on which, as it says, the finger of God had written? To what extent are these commandments really supposed to come from God? Answer, this Moses is the man who has been touched by God. Whether there really were any stone tablets is another question. How far we should take this story literally is another question. Benedict XVI teaches that sentences in the Bible are not true. Benedict XVI, God in the World, page 153, quote, it is quite impossible to pick out one single sentence and say, Right, you find this sentence in God's great book, so it must simply be true in itself. Bank the 16th on evolution. Bank the 16th, God in the World, page 76, quote, In the beginning the earth was bare and empty, then God fashioned man. We can even read into this representation something like evolution. Bank the 16th, God in the World, page 139, quote, the Christian picture of the world is this, that the world in its details is the product of a long process of evolution. Bank the 16th insulting Catholic dogma. Bank the 16th insults the Council of Trent's decree on the Eucharist. Bank the 16th Feast of Faith, 1981, page 130, quote, The Council of Trent concludes its remarks on Corpus Christi with something which offends our ecumenical ears and has doubtless contributed not a little toward discrediting this feast in the opinion of our Protestant brethren. But if we purge its formulation of the passionate tone of the 16th century, we shall be surprised by something great and positive. Bank the 16th says that the Council of Trent's infallible declaration offends his ecumenical ears, and that its formulation needs to be purged, which means to make clean or rid of objectionable elements. This is totally heretical. Bank the 16th says that Trent's doctrine on the priesthood was weak and disastrous in its effect. Bank the 16th Principles of Catholic Theology, pages 247-248, talking about the Protestant versus Catholic views of the priesthood, quote, The Council of Trent did not attempt here a comprehensive treatment of the problem as a whole. Therein lies the weakness of the text it promulgated the effect of which was all the more disastrous. Bank the 16th totally blasphemes church tradition. Bank the 16th Principles of Catholic Theology, page 100, quote, The problem of tradition as it exists in the church. The church is tradition, into which, let us admit, much human pseudo-tradition has found its way. So much so, in fact, that even and even precisely, the Church has contributed to the general crisis of tradition that afflicts mankind. This is a repudiation of one of the two sources of revelation, sacred tradition. Pope Pius IX, Vatican Council I, ex cathedra, quote, All those things must be believed which are contained in the written word of God and in tradition. Bank the 16th Principles of Catholic Theology, page 378, quote, Not every valid council in the history of the Church has been a fruitful one. In the last analysis, many of them have been just a waste of time. Benedict the 16th teaches that the term original sin is false. Benedict the 16th in the beginning 1986 page 72 quote, "Theology refers to this state of affairs by the certainly misleading and imprecise term original sin. The Council of Trent promulgated an infallible decree on original sin." in which it used the term original sin no fewer than four times. Benedict the 16th criticizes the Apostles' Creed. Benedict the 16th Introduction to Christianity, 2004, page 326, quote, Perhaps it will have to be admitted that the tendency to such a false development, which only sees the dangers of responsibility and no longer the freedom of love, is already present in the Apostles' Creed. Bank the 16th admitting that Vatican II has changed or rejected Catholic dogma. 
Benedict XVI admits that Vatican II contradicts the infallible teaching of Pope Pius IX on religious liberty and false religions. Benedict XVI, Principles of Catholic Theology, page 381, quote, If it is desirable to offer a diagnosis of the text of the Vatican II document Gaudium et Spes as a whole, we might say that, in conjunction with the text on religious liberty and world religions, it is a revision of the syllabus of Pius IX, a kind of counter-syllabus. As a result, the one-sidedness of the position adopted by the Church under Pius IX was to a large extent corrected. Benedict XVI could not be more formally heretical. He is admitting that Vatican II's teaching, which he adheres to, is directly contrary to the teaching of the Magisterium in the Syllabus of Errors condemned by Pius IX. We have shown in other videos that Vatican II's teaching on religious liberty contradicts traditional Catholic teaching and was in fact condemned by many popes. Benedict XVI just admitted it. One could hardly ask for more of a confirmation that the teaching of Vatican II is heretical. In his book, Benedict XVI repeats this again and again, calling the teaching of Vatican II the counter-syllabus and saying that there can be no return to the syllabus of errors. Bank the Sixteenth Principles of Catholic Theology, page 385, quote, The counter-syllabus gave way to a new cry that was far more intense. Bank the Sixteenth Principles of Catholic Theology, page 391, quote, The task is not, therefore, to suppress the council, but to discover the real council. That means that there can be no return to the syllabus. This is astounding heresy. Benedict the Sixteenth acknowledges that the Vatican II sect has abandoned the Catholic Church's traditional prohibition of cremation. Benedict the Sixteenth, God in the World, page 436, quote, question, is it permissible to have dead bodies cremated, or is that just a heathen ritual? Answer, right up to the Second Vatican Council, cremation was subject to penalties. In view of all the circumstances of the modern world, the Church has abandoned this. The Church's traditional law condemns cremation and forbids ecclesiastical burial to those who requested it. Benedict XVI's Heresies Against the Church Benedict XVI says that Church teaching does not exclude those who hold opposing views. Benedict XVI, Principles of Catholic Theology, page 229, quote, The statement of the congregation proposes to meet the crisis by a positive presentation, especially of those points of Church doctrine that are under dispute and to establish the identity of Catholicism, not by excluding those who hold opposing views. This is blatantly heretical. Pope Eugene IV, Council of Florence, 1441, quote, Therefore the Holy Roman Church condemns, reproves, anathematizes, and declares to be outside the body of Christ, which is the Church, whoever holds opposing or contrary views. Benedict XVI teaches that the Church exists outside the Church. Bank the 16th, Co-Workers of the Truth, 1990, page 29, quote, There neither can nor should be any disavowal of the presence of Christ and of Christian values among separated Christians. Catholic theology must state more clearly than ever before that, along with the actual presence of the word outside her boundaries, church is also present there in one form or another. Benedict XVI states that the church itself exists outside of the church. This is heretical nonsense which denies that there is only one church. The Nicene Constantinople Creed 381 ex cathedra, quote, We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Benedict XVI totally rejects the unity of the Catholic Church. The unity or oneness of the Catholic Church is a very important dogma. It is one of the four marks of the church, as in one holy Catholic and apostolic. When heretics form sects, they don't break the unity of the Catholic Church, which cannot be broken. They simply leave the Catholic Church. Pope Leo XIII, Satis Cognitum, number 4, June 29, 1896, quote, The Church in respect of its unity belongs to the category of things, indivisible by nature. Pope Leo XIII, Satis Cognitum, number 5, quote, This unity cannot be broken nor the one body divided by the separation of its constituent parts. But Benedict XVI totally rejects the dogma of the unity of the Catholic Church. Bank the Sixteenth Principles of Catholic Theology, page 147, quote, The fathers we can now say were the theological teachers of the undivided Church. 
Benedict XVI teaches that the church was united in the first millennium, but that it was divided after that time by the schismatic revolt and the Protestant revolt. This is a total repudiation of one of the four marks of the Catholic Church. It alone would prove that he is not a Catholic. Benedict XVI, Principles of Catholic Theology, page 145 and 146, quote, The fathers are the teachers of the yet undivided church. Benedict XVI, Co-Workers of the Truth, 1990, page 29, quote, This means that even in Catholic belief, the unity of the church is still in the process of formation, that it will be totally achieved only in the eschaton. Benedict XVI says that the unity of the church, the oneness of the church, one of the four marks of the church, does not exist and will not exist until the eschaton, the end of the world. This is totally heretical. Pope Pius XI, Mortali Manumus, number 7, January 6, 1928, quote, Here it seems opportune to expound and to refute a certain false opinion, for they are of the opinion that the unity of faith and government which is a note of the one true Church of Christ, has hardly up to the present time existed, and does not today exist. Other Heresies of Benedict XVI Benedict XVI respects Hans Kung's path of denial of Jesus Christ. For those who don't know, Hans Kung denies papal infallibility and the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, among other things. Hans Kung can correctly be described as an Arian since he denies that our Lord is of the same substance as the Father. Benedict XVI saw the earth, 1996, pages 95 and 96, quote, He, Hans Kung, has taken back nothing of his contestation of the papal office. Indeed, he has further radicalized his positions. In Christology and in Trinitarian theology, he has further distanced himself from the faith of the Church. I respect his path which he takes in accord with his conscience. Benedict XVI doesn't merely say he respects Hans Kung, which would be bad enough. He says that he respects his path, that is, the denial of Jesus Christ. This is total apostasy. Benedict XVI denies the resurrection of the body. The resurrection of the body is a very important dogma. Besides being part of the Apostles' Creed, this dogma has been defined more than almost any other dogma of the faith. Pope Gregory X, Second Council of Leon, 1274, ex cathedra, quote, The same most holy Roman church firmly believes and firmly declares that nevertheless on the day of judgment, all men will be brought together with their bodies before the tribunal of Christ to render an account of their own deeds. Pope Innocent III, 1215, ex cathedra, quote, All of whom will rise with their bodies, which they now bear. Pope Benedict XII, 1336, ex cathedra, quote, All men with their bodies will make themselves ready to render an account of their own deeds. Benedict XVI blatantly denies this dogma and proves again that he is a manifest heretic. Benedict XVI, Introduction to Christianity, 2004, page 349, quote, It now becomes clear that the real heart of faith in the resurrection does not consist at all in the idea of the restoration of bodies to which we have reduced it in our thinking. Benedict XVI, Introduction to Christianity, page 353, quote, The biblical pronouncements about the resurrection, their essential content is not the conception of a restoration of bodies to souls after a long interval. Benedict XVI, Introduction to Christianity, pages 357 and 358, quote, To recapitulate, Paul teaches not the resurrection of physical bodies, but the resurrection of persons. This is totally heretical. Conclusion. In its article on papal elections, the 1914 Catholic Encyclopedia states, quote, Of course the election of a heretic, schismatic, or female as pope would be null and void. In his bull, Cum Ex Apostolatus Officio, Pope Paul IV teaches that a heretic cannot be a validly elected pope, even if the election took place with the unanimous consent of all the cardinals. St. Antoninus, St. Robert Bellarmine, and St. Francis de Sales all teach that a heretic cannot be a valid pope. St. Robert Bellarmine, quote, A pope who is a manifest heretic automatically ceases to be pope and head, just as he ceases automatically to be a Christian and a member of the church, wherefore he can be judged and punished by the church. This is the teaching of all the ancient fathers, 
who teach that manifest heretics immediately lose all jurisdiction. St. Francis de Sales, Doctor of the Church, quote, Now when he, the Pope, is explicitly a heretic, he falls ipso facto from his dignity and out of the Church. St. Antoninus, 1459, quote, In the case in which the Pope would become a heretic, he would find himself by that fact alone, and without any other sentence, separated from the Church. A head separated from a body cannot, as long as it remains separated, be head of the same body from which it was cut off. A pope who would be separated from the church by heresy, therefore, would by that very fact itself cease to be head of the church. He could not be a heretic and remain pope, because since he is outside of the church, he cannot possess the keys of the church. There have been over forty antipopes in church history, men who claim to be valid popes, but who were not canonically elected. Some of these antipopes even reigned in Rome for periods of time. Benedict XVI is a manifest heretic. We have proven this without any doubt. He teaches that our Lord may not be the Messiah, that the Old Covenant is valid, that Jews and others can be saved without believing in Christ, that schismatics and Protestants don't need conversion, that non-Catholics are not bound to accept Vatican I, that Protestant monasteries should be formed, that Protestantism itself is not even heresy, that Mass is valid without any words of consecration, that infant baptism has no purpose, that Scripture is filled with myths, that the false religion of Islam is noble, that pagan religions are high, that salvation can be had outside the Church, that Catholic dogmas need to be purged, that Vatican II rejected Catholic teaching on religious liberty that the unity of the church does not exist, and that the resurrection of the body will not occur just to name a few. According to the teaching of the Catholic Church, Benedict XVI is not a pope, but a non-Catholic anti-pope whom Catholics must completely reject. He presides over the new religion of Vatican II, a counterfeit Catholicism that has abandoned the Catholic Church's traditions and dogmas. And one of Benedict XVI's main characteristics is that he is a deceiver. While he teaches undeniable, astounding, and manifest heresies, one of the ways by which he has convinced so many that he is a conservative is that among these astounding heresies in his writings, there are many conservative passages. But this is nothing new. Pope Pius VI pointed out that heretics inspired by the devil have always used such tactics to inculcate heresies and deceive people. Pope Pius VI pointed out that camouflaging the heresies in statements that are ambiguous or seemingly conservative or contradictory was the tactic of the heretic Nestorius, and that Catholics cannot allow heretics to get away with this or deceive them by it. They must hold such heretics to their heresies regardless. Heretics have always used ambiguity and deception to insinuate their heresies and make them seem not quite as bad. In fact, the more deceptive the heretic is, usually equates to how successful he is for the devil. The heretic Arius effectively spread his denial of the divinity of Christ because he impressed them with his appearance of asceticism and devotion. Pope Pius VI taught that if someone veils a heresy in ambiguity, A Catholic must hold him to the heretical meaning and denounce the heretical meaning which is camouflage in ambiguity. But this is only common sense. If a man says that he is against abortion, but repeatedly votes in favor of it, he is a supporter of abortion and a heretic. The fact that he sometimes claims to hold church teaching against abortion means nothing. Likewise, the fact that Benedict XVI says some conservative, ambiguous, or contradictory things doesn't change the fact that he teaches astounding heresies and is not a Catholic. Benedict XVI is one of the most wicked men in human history, for he alleges to wield the authority of the Church of Christ while teaching that one is free to deny Jesus Christ. He alleges to be the Pope while he teaches that people are free to reject the papacy. He alleges to be the leader of the Christian faith while teaching that our Lord Jesus Christ doesn't even have to be seen as the Messiah. So don't be fooled if Benedict XVI, inspired by the devil, makes some conservative gestures to keep people in the Vatican II apostate religion. Don't be fooled if he makes the traditional Mass more widely available or reaches out in other ways to traditionally-minded groups. 
The devil will concede all of this just as long as one accepts Benedict XVI's new religion, or accepts Benedict XVI and his apostate bishops as Catholics, while they teach that Jesus Christ and the Catholic faith are meaningless. It is predicted in Catholic prophecy that in the final days there will be a massive apostasy from the Catholic faith from the city of Rome itself. This is because it comes from antipopes who are posing as true popes and who have created a counterfeit sect. Our Lady of La Salette, France, September 19, 1846, quote, Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. The church will be in eclipse. Our Lady of La Salette tells us that Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist, and that the church will be in eclipse. This coincides with the prophecies in sacred scripture Apocalypse 17 and 18, that the city of seven hills, Rome, will become a harlot. The great harlot prophesied in the Bible is not the Catholic Church. It is the counterfeit Catholic Church, the Vatican II sect, the apostate phony bride, which arises in the last days to deceive Catholics and eclipse the true church which has been reduced to a remnant. We can see that Our Lady's message at La Salette, France has been fulfilled before our very eyes. Benedict XVI and the Vatican II sect teach that Jews are perfectly free not to believe in Jesus Christ. This is published in Benedict XVI and the Vatican's own books. It proves that Rome has become the seat of the Antichrist. Our Lord also indicates in the last days there will be the abomination of desolation in the holy place, Matthew 24, 15. He tells us that there will be a deception so profound that if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived. He even asks if there will be any faith left on earth. Luke 18, verse 8, quote, But yet the Son of Man, when he cometh, shall he find, thank you, faith on earth. This deception will happen in the very heart of the church's physical structures, in the temple of God, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, and the holy place, Matthew 24, 15, and will arise because people receive not the love of the truth. God allows this as the supreme punishment for the world's sins. We are currently living through this apostasy and deception. People need to completely reject anti-Pope Benedict XVI, the New Mass, and the New Apostate Vatican II religion.